People are calling me the Spike Lee of the Nets. I'm not saying that. Some people have said that on Twitter. I didn't say it, but it's been, I've never it's, been courtside. Just saying. Just put in the, in the, in the atmosphere. So that's that's. I'm just putting. I'm right. just putting it. I'm just saying. People are saying. People are saying that Nick Claxton really took off once I threw my support behind him. All right, Mina. Tell me the first thing you remember wanting to be when you grew up. Besides a net super fan? <laughs> Besides net super fan. Uh, Which is um, so appreciated, painter. as you know. Oh, I appreciate You know, I, I'm just going to start off with this. Uh, I feel like Nets fans get a lot of shade from the mainstream media, the rest of the basketball fandom. As a super fan slash bandwagon fan, I have to say Nets fans are amazing. Like they have been so welcoming to me. They're so passionate. Um, they get so much hate from the rest of the NBA world and NBA Twitter. And they, <laughs> I feel like this is, they deserve all of this. So I'm very happy for them. Um, but no, well, I did not want to be a net super fan as a child. <laughs> that, that was, that was not true. Uh, I wanted to be a painter when I was little. Oh, what inspired that? Um, I just really like painting. By the uh, way, cause I, cause I love what, I love what I see you put, <laughs> you put out there on social media from what I see. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's just a hobby now. Like, I'm not that good at it, but um, it's like uh, a nice diversion. You know, when you're in like the fourth quarter and it's a blowout, I'll pull out the watercolors, oh. paint James Harden or whatever inspires me. <laughs> what? Why do you think the Nets get so much hate? Uh, I mean, you know, I mean... <laughs> uh, the ultimate super team. Um, mm. You know, the, the, the big bad wolves, they represent some things that have happened in basketball that people don't like in terms of player mobility, the way teams, it's not new, you know that, but it is yeah. an extreme example of it. Um, I think they're also, the, the, the three stars are somewhat divisive amongst certain corners of the NBA <laughs> world, each of them. Uh, so I think that combining them all and then having it actually work out is infuriating to people. Okay, now let me go back to let me go back to childhood. You mentioned wanting to be a painter. Okay. Do you remember falling in love with sports? Do you remember the first time you did? Yeah. Uh, so football, it, it's what I, I cover primarily at ESPN. I'm an NFL analyst, and it was my favorite sport as a kid too. I mean, I love baseball. Grew up a Mariners fan. Grew up a Sonics fan, which is why, by the way, my fandom is always up for grabs as being from <laughs> Seattle. But um, yeah, I, I love watching college football. Um, I grew up a Nebraska football fan, weirdly, at a moment when it was really exciting to do that. So for me, watching some of those dominant Nebraska teams in the 90s is when I really fell in love with the game. Oh, man. Now, now what role did your father have in this sports fan? Uh, massive football fan and that's probably why football first and foremost like my dad likes basketball and baseball but football is number one for him uh he's from seattle so that's why i refer seattle teams is yeah. My dad. yeah no so how much would you love to see it we, we're embracing your brooklyn nets fandom how much would you love to see a team back in seattle and supersonics back doing their thing yeah people have asked me would you go back to seattle of course i would if they got a team uh, but I will say, you know, it, there's nothing wrong with having a West Coast team and an East Coast team. Uh, uh, but yeah, I would I would absolutely embrace. And they, they, so I think it sounds like there's some positive momentum on the front in the NBA and God willing, it happens soon. All right. Your journey from, you know, coming out of college at Yale and then the mm -hmm. titles that you held before stepping in at ESPN and that opportunity come. Yeah, I was a business journalist for a long time. We worked at uh, Fortune Small Business, Fortune Magazine, then Bloomberg um, before coming to ESPN, where I was a, a writer at first for ESPN, uh, writing features about everything, football, basketball, what have you, before I became um, an analyst and host. Was that, was that um, opportunity at ESPN? Could you tell me about, about that? You know, don't be on the Bloomberg and that side of things. You mentioned your, your passion for sports and then getting that opportunity with ESPN. Sure. How'd that come about? Yeah. So I was an investigative reporter, uh, at Bloomberg, but 
working in business, still spent all my free time watching football and not just watching football, but tweeting about football, mostly really dumb stuff uh, and writing <laughs> just for myself, uh, writing, I wrote a personal essay about football and ESPN saw that I was doing all this football content, I guess, for myself, <laughs> reached out to me, asked if I'd be interested in making the job, it wasn't something I was pursuing or thought I would ever do. Um, but I decided to kind of, you know, you only get a chance to do what you love not that often in life. So I uh, took the offer and I think 2014. 2014. And then transition into television um, is, is something that's also wild as well. When was that, when was that <laughs> first time you were on camera for ESPN? Well, so I, I would go on camera to talk about my stories. Like uh, if I had written a story, uh -huh. for example, you know, when, when, back when I was writing more often, I did a piece on Luka Doncic where I went to Spain a couple of times. And after writing yeah. that, I went on the job to talk about it. I went on sports center, you know, I I'd, I'd have these appearances, but I didn't, I wasn't a regular analyst until 2017 when I started doing uh, around the horn and highly questionable, uh, which are, you know, you do general, we cover all sports on those shows um and then football you know I I was always my main passion and sort of area of expertise and um when we rebooted NFL live last summer I became a regular on that show so I still do those other shows but NFL live is now like kind of my home base and well speaking of that home base first full-time woman NFL analyst at ESPN what does that what does that mean to you um, it, I think it's just kind of wild that that's the phrase we're saying in 2021, like it's yeah. taken that long, you know, and, and that not just that, but that there's still, um, that there aren't others. I think it is shows we still have a really long way to go in terms of diversifying in football, because I actually think basketball is ahead of football in that regard. There's a lot more um, women doing, you know, not just hosting and reporting, but doing analysis in basketball, especially at ESPN. Obviously, we have the great Doris Burke and Rachel Nichols, but also younger women. I mean, Shanae, uh, Monica McNutt, we got. Granted, <laughs> she focuses on a team that I don't like that much, you know, with the right. names. But <laughs> point is, like, it, it, and of course, you work with the great Sarah Kustak. So um, I think basketball football really needs to catch up to basketball in that regard. The, the you inspire a lot of people, um, as you know, um, but from a specifically from a representation standpoint, the role that you have, the visibility that you have, how how important, how big is that for you? Um, you know, it, it, uh, it's very nice of you to say. And um, for me, I just kind of focus on I, I want to sort of bring a level of preparation, excitement, passion, originality to my approach so that when people are watching, they really don't think about my gender or my ethnicity um, and it becomes normalized, frankly. And, and I think we you know we're kind of getting there, but um, it, it's, a, it's a lot of pressure because I feel, because I don't want to like, screw it up for everyone else. Uh, I know, you know, I know everyone can kind of relate to that feeling, not everyone, but those of us who aren't in the majority can relate to that kind of feeling. So, um, I, you know, I, I really, I, I, it is a privilege, but I try not to think about it too much. Um, it would, it, it would have been nice to, to see you in the house, but you were, uh, you were recognized and honored at bank at uh, Barclays uh -huh. center. Uh, can you just tell me, Great honor. tell me a little bit about that and how you, how you found out that that was coming about. <laughs> Malika texted me. She was like, I think you're just on the jumbo. Malika Andrews, of course, texted me. She's like, I think you're just on the jumbotron. I just started laughing so hard because um, this is so infuriating to like my colleagues who are, you know, lifelong Knicks fans and Sixers fans. Here I am, <laughs> ultimate bandwagoner, just stampeding in as a heel turn. And I'm already on the jumbotron. Uh, and you know what? That's credit to uh, to to the Nets, Nets world. <laughs> Hashtag Brooklyn together because um, they really reward passion. I think. Yes. Um, yeah, and I've got passion, Michael. I've got it. <laughs> I it started as a bit, but I, now it's like I in game one 
uh, against Boston, I was genuinely like, I'm so upset right now and stressed in the first half when they were like, you know, one for 500 from three. I was like, why are my hands? I'm stress eating. And it's like, like, wait, I thought this was just like a bit. It's not a bit anymore. These are like real feelings, real passion. You know, for, you know, for me, sometimes uh, it's, it's the passion from the fan base that excites me and gets me engaged. And then it's also the trash talkers and the people who don't like the fact that you're cheering on this specific team that makes you even a little bit more invested. <laughs> have you gotten people, yeah. have you got the Knicks people? Have you gotten other people saying, Mina, what are you, what are you doing? Yeah, um, it's, it's a divisive <laughs> like point that I've, you know, it's a divisive take, divisive alliance I've made. I just taped a um, podcast. It was JJ Reddick's podcast and Miro, I don't know if you know Miro from these Miro Knicks fans <laughs> on. Yeah. And um, he, he was like, you know, it's like he was talking about me. He said, it's like when you have a relative who has like political views you don't agree with. You, you got to try to like, you don't want to alienate them too much. You just got to try to show them what, what the errors of their ways. Um, and I said, you know what? You, you can have your popular team and your beloved fan base. I've, I've picked my side and I feel great about it. I'm never leaving. <laughs> we love that. You know, the fan base loves that. Uh, on Yes Network, we have our, our crew, um, you know, Iron Eagle, you mentioned. Sarah Kustak, great people behind the scenes and, you know, yes. the chemistry and folks, you know, tell us how much they appreciate and love that chemistry. When I, when I see you and the crew on NFL Live, I see genuine I chemistry uh, where off, you know, off camera, it seems like you guys absolutely get along. And so could you just tell me about the vibe that you have and the uh, you know, that work environment there with NFL Live? Thank, thank you for saying that. And I, I want to, I, I know I mentioned Sarah earlier, but like I said, I've watched every Nets game, which means I've watched all the different broadcasts. You guys do a terrific job. And it's part of what's like pulled me into the Nets is because the broadcast is so engaging and fun. Um, it's, it's one of the many reasons why I've embraced it. But um, yeah, no, I, I am blessed to work on NFL Live with like my really good friends um, who I was friends with before we did the show. Laura Rutledge, Dan Orlowski, Marcus Spears, Ryan Clark, it's amazing. And we um, genuinely like cut it up, not only or, like when we're not airing, we've got the group texts, you know, just roasting each other and sending jokes, but like during the show and the commercial breaks, just um, because I, I, I like watching people on TV who like each other and are having a good time and respect each other. Um, and I hope that comes across always when we're on TV together. No, it absolutely does. What, what do you love most about breaking down the game? I, I've heard people talk about, you know, if you want to make it as an athlete, it's not just, you have to not just love the games, yeah. but you also have to have a certain level of appreciation and passion for the practice and the work it takes to perform well in those games. And um, I, I have to imagine it's not much different, at least from my perspective, I'm sure you can speak to this um, when it comes to preparing for being on air, which you alluded to a little bit earlier. What do you, what do you love most about the game and breaking it down? Yeah. You know, football's there, there's a, it's tricky in that not only are there 32 teams, there's so many players. And on our show, we talk about all of the teams and, you know, like obviously covering basketball is incredibly nuanced as well, but it's, it's less, it's less characters. Football's like game of Thrones basketball is <laughs> Harry Potter. Actually, Harry Potter has a lot of characters oh. too, so maybe it's not a good comp, but you know, it's a lot to keep track of. So that can get a little bit taxing, but what I, what I love about footballs is what football is that while there's so many teams and you got to remain this constantly like, turnover and, and things that are changing in the game, there are also, you know, fundamental principles and um, sort of, tricks and and insights and things that you when you start to see them it's like when you watch the game it's different you just see it differently it's almost like um unlocking it you know and uh that's what i like about it because it's such a complex sport when you have all the time in the world like i do to learn about it and uh study 
it makes the actual experience of watching it more enjoyable. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a new day, obviously. You know, we're not getting, you know, fan mail or hate mail as it is. And now it's instantaneous. How do you, how do you amuse yourself with people who, um, <laughs> who, have, who have comments or want to comment on your commentary, your take or whatever it may be? Um, so I have it on Twitter. So I only see people if they follow me. There you go. That, it, the reply. So that, that weeds out a lot of the worst of it. Very <laughs> useful for anyone who watches <laughs> this. Highly recommend that. Um, but uh, yeah, I mostly, it's mostly just like, I just don't really look at it because it's just too much. Uh, every now and then I'll catch something. Um, yeah. But yeah, I try, I, I, I mix it up a little bit, but I try not to mix it up too much because it's too time consuming. Yeah, well, that's, that's one place that could be a crazy place. Let's go to a happy place. Uh, Lenny, let's talk about, you know, Lenny. the podcast, the Mini Con, <laughs> con Show uh, with Lenny. Where yeah. is Lenny, by the way? Is Lenny? He's in his bed over there. I was going to get yeah. him. I don't know if there's like a Nets bed that's like a hat. It's like a Nets hat for a dog <laughs> walks into. I was thinking <laughs> on getting him a jersey, too. I want like a split Harden Kyrie, KD, Jersey, or something with all three of them for him. Just the most infuriating possible thing I can come up with. But, um, you know, maybe like with the Basquiat, that's fine. But um, he's good, man. You know, he, he's he's a, a big star, as you know. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, a lot of demands on his time, attention. He try, I you know, I try to keep him humble. <laughs> it's not easy. It's not. <laughs> Not easy. You know how it is. And he's got his own. He's got his own show. Um, what do you What do you love about that platform, the podcast? You know, versus you know, television versus the platform of uh, podcasts. And one more time to to share your thoughts. Yeah, yeah. It's time you can kind of geek out about stuff. Like this last week, I had my friend Charles McDonald, um, who uh, mm. used to cover. You might you might know him covers football. But um, he comes on my show a bit and, you know, we spent like 30 minutes talking about um, Travis Etienne and Najee Harris cross training as wide receivers and what it means like for running back value. Like that's really nerdy. shit. So like, you know, I'm not going to spend 30 minutes talking about that on TV or the radio. And that's great. That's the great thing about having a podcast format is like you can really get into your passions. And, you know, I, I also use it to like learn from my friends, like whether it's Charles or Dominic Foxworth or Michael Jr., the guys, you know, I have on a lot. They always teach me stuff through conversation. And, and I think it's really, um, it's a really fun experience. All right, so uh, as we as we wrap, you're on the West Coast. If, yeah. if could, could we get you to Brooklyn one day? Is it possible to get you? You have a demand? 100%. Schedule. I would love Hi. it. Oh, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna work on this. We're gonna, we're gonna work on this. We wanna make this happen, for sure, for sure. Spike Lee at Barclays Center. Me and Colin. <laughs> <laughs> Me and you're the best. I, I appreciate it. I feel you. that that's like offensive on a hundred levels, but it wasn't, it, I didn't say it. Someone on the internet said it, so. <laughs> we're, we're running with it. We're it's running with good. it. Thank I just need that Bruce Brown jersey. Then I'm, I'll be set. Oh, done. The guy, done. Bruce. <laughs> done. Hey, we got you. We got you. Mina, thank you so much. Appreciate you.